Well, welcome once again, one and all, to Tune In Tuesday. And thanks again, John. Tonight, we'll be considering believing. So let's get started right away by turning to Romans chapter 4. Verse 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, that's a great summation concerning Abraham's heart. Please turn to Hebrews 11. We'll, we'll pick up a couple more references in particular. And in verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. And in verses 17 through 19, we read, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. It's curious here that Isaac is stated as Abraham's only begotten son despite the fact that he actually had another child earlier named Ishmael. Now it would be foolish to suppose this is somehow a contradiction. And if that's the case, then it's merely in our understanding. You see, the idea here is that as far as God was concerned, Ishmael was out of the picture, so to speak, because he and his mother Hagar had been cast out. So in a very practical sense, Isaac was considered as Abraham's only son so that the figure could be portrayed accurately. And what's the figure? We should immediately pick up on the fact that the same scenario was actually going to play out for real in the future when God's only begotten son was offered as our sacrifice and after three days and nights in the heart of the earth was raised from the dead. All in all, here in Hebrews, God sort of cut to the chase without elaborating upon the exact details so we could understand that God simply honored Abraham with righteousness because of just one thing, his believing. Turn to Genesis 12, 1. This is the place Hebrews eleven eight 8 was speaking of. Verse 1 through 4a. Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, or Abram, sorry, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curses thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. It's interesting that here, God says all families of the earth shall be blessed. So... Can we suppose this to be a subtle indication of the eventual inclusion of Gentiles as yet another shadow of things to come? Well, sure we can. Now, was this promise to Abraham fulfilled immediately? Heavens no. A lot of time transpired and many other things happened from this point until Genesis 22, when we read about the record, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19 referenced about Abraham taking his son up to Mount Moriah. As an aside, the history of this mountain is also very interesting. It's the same place that King David chose for his son Solomon to build a temple. And Solomon's temple served as the central place of Jewish worship for about 400 years until its destruction by the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar in about 586 BC. Though it was eventually rebuilt, it was destroyed again about 70 AD, this time courtesy of the Roman army. And it seems God isn't through with it yet. According to Revelations, the temple will exist yet again during the millennium after Jesus returns to earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, anyways, Abraham was about 75 years old when God first gave him that promise in Genesis 12:1. So what happened after that? About four chapters later, we come to Genesis 16, verses 1 and 2. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. 
I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. Now, we won't be reading the entire record tonight. You can do that on your own later if you like. Basically, Abram went along with his wife's idea. In their hearts, they merely wanted to fulfill God's promise to Abram. And soon after, we see this in verse 5. And Sarah said unto Abram, my wrong be upon thee. In other words, hey, Abe, oops, my bad. <laughs> and Abram allowed Sarai to do with Hagar as she pleased. And he goes on to say that she treated her very harshly to the point that Hagar just took off. Oh, that poor woman. When I first read this record some years ago, my heart went out to her. How about you guys? But later on, an angel appeared to her by a fountain in the wilderness, informed her she was pregnant, and encouraged her to go back, and that the child was to be named Ishmael, who was to be the father of a great multitude. Now, I'll bet that gave her a lot of joy, huh? Verse 16, and Abram was fourscore and six years old, that's 86, when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. So, 11 years had elapsed so far, and beginning in the next chapter, we move ahead 13 more years. Genesis 17, 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. God goes on to inform him that his name is now changed from Abram to Abraham and that he'll be the father of many nations. And this is where he first learned that circumcision would be required. And of course, even here, it was still a long time before the written law was to be given to Moses. Let's pick up the record in verse 15, where we'll eventually notice that it wasn't until an entire year later that Abram actually circumcised himself. Genesis 17, 15 through 18. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. So her name got changed here too. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be the mother of nations. And kings of people shall be of her. Then Abram fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall the child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abram said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Hey, was God angry with Abram for saying in so many words, oh, What do I need another son for? Ishmael is good enough for me. No. Was it really so wrong for him to laugh like he did? No. It's not wrong to talk things over with God. Remember Peter voicing his objection to God in Acts 14, saying, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Remember that? And God answers Abraham in verse 19 through 21. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him, and as for Israel, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at. Now get this. This set time in the next year. Now that sure was a showstopper, wasn't it? Look at the next verse. 22. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abram. So I guess Abram got the point, huh? No more objections. It goes on to say that he circumcised himself, Ishmael, and all the men which were in his house. So now, 24 years had elapsed since Genesis 12:1. 75 plus 24 equals 99. And a lot more happened throughout the next year until Isaac was born, including the record of Sodom and Gomorrah. Turn to Romans 4. Some think these verses sound rather redundant and confusing to an extent. So, by reading this slowly and carefully with a proper inflection, we'll see that it's really simple after all. Romans 4, 9 through 12. 
Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abram for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also who walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. And here's the point Paul was making in those verses. It wasn't the ceremony of circumcision which mattered, nor yet the ceremony of baptism either while we're at it. Rather, he's emphasizing that believing is what really counts in God's eyes. Now, Paul had addressed this a bit earlier as well in Romans. Turn to Romans 2, explaining that during our administration of grace, God doesn't consider someone a Jew because of some evidence in the flesh. Verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So again, what really matters in the long run is what's in someone's heart because God honors believing. Well, back to Genesis 18. I want you to notice something else about Sarah after she overheard that she was to have a son by Abraham. Genesis 18, 12 through 15. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself saying, after I'm waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Yep, yeah, you laughed. Now, it's interesting that the Hebrew word for Isaac means he laughs. Surely we know God has a sense of humor, but the significance of her son being named Isaac wasn't for Sarah to have a constant reminder of her former doubt. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It was to commemorate the very moment she truly believed with all her heart to become pregnant by Abraham. You see, the turning point in her mind was when she realized how Abram could possibly have known what she was thinking. And since she never laughed out loud, she was then able to see God's hand in the situation. Turn to Hebrews 11.11. 11. Hebrews 11.11. 11. Through faith. See that? Also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. By this, we realize it wasn't Abraham alone who was credited because it says Sarah believed also. And once again, we see here how God sort of cut to the chase. By reading the actual records, we saw many details about what actually happened from the time Abraham was 75, when God first indicated his seed would be great, until he fathered Isaac at the age of 100. And what about later on, when Abram took Isaac up to Mount Moriah? Sure, it appears as though he was about to make a mistake, where it says in Genesis 22:10, and I quote, and Abram stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But we know that's not how it actually played out, don't we? So it took time for both Abram and his wife to adjust their thinking according to that which God had said. Even as he was patient with them, God's the same with us. And it blesses his heart when we follow his example by being patient with others also. 
and we understand what's really important to God is the end result, which emanates from one's innermost being, his heart of hearts, and that's believing. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, 6 through 9. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel under Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Isn't it an interesting how, because of faith or believing, that God considers the born-again believers to be Abraham's children, even if their actual physical lineage can't be traced back to Abraham? Well, that's got to be some sort of miracle, huh? And no doubt, because our new birth really is a miracle. And that isn't so far-fetched when we think of it. Actually, the whole idea of some greater life beyond human life is based upon miracles, isn't it? After all, wasn't it a miracle that I was, was born in the first place? And what about Mary having Jesus? Yes, indeed, a lot of miracles happened over time to pave the way for eternal life. By the same token, it also took time for the first century believers to adjust their thinking and actions according to what God was revealing to them. But before we get into some of those details, Please turn to James chapter 3. I want to take a little tangent about how we change our minds in general. James chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, of them that make peace. There appears to be a very logical progression here. So let's look at these verses a bit closer. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Many times we're faced with something a bit different than what we've been used to, which has that certain ring of truth to it. And even though it sounds a bit foreign at first, there's just something about it which makes so much sense to us that we simply can't deny it despite the initial shock because it's something rather new. Many times this happens to us while someone is teaching the word and you hear things you've never even considered before. So do we give up on it just because it's different? Do we tune out? Well, I should hope not because this is tune in Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, anyway, do we ignore that initial gut feeling or do we consider it for a bit and see where it leads? Well, what happens when we follow it? It leads to the next thing in the progression, then peaceable. You see, after a while, such things aren't as shocking as they were at first. And even though you're not quite there yet, it's a lot easier to put a handle on it by then because in addition to the initial info you have, more to go on now because you've been gathering more details all along the way. So what's next in the list? It becomes gentle. By that time, you're actually becoming very comfortable with that new idea. And as you continue, what comes after that? Easy to be entreated. See the progression? Now it's no longer strange or foreign or upsetting or any of those things because it makes total sense. In fact, it might just become so simple and easy that one could look back and wonder why he ever had a problem with it in the first place. Well, we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves. After all, we didn't understand it then as we do now. So I guess that's where the next thing in the list comes in, mercy. How easy is it to simply let those former things go once we know better? It's just like the Apostle Paul before he became born again, who said of himself later on in 1 Timothy 1.13, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained Mercy. Why? Because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. It's not surprising that unbelief here is the word apostia. 
He simply hadn't known any better. And we never see him treating the believers that way again, do we? Even though I know you get the point, I'd like to reinforce it. Look at Proverbs 28, verse 13. Proverbs 28, 13. And he that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. And shall means absolutely. Do you see that? God's mercy isn't automatic as many suppose, but it's absolutely guaranteed when those two conditions are met. For instance, was Paul sorry for what he had done to the Christians once he knew better? Well, sure he was. And just as important, did he stop doing it? Well, of course he did. So it makes perfect sense why God granted him mercy because he both owned up to and forsook his mistake. Okay, point made. Back to James 3. We read on. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We see here that it produces good fruits. And we also see that these are to be sown in peace. Once we get that good fruit for ourselves, we spread it abroad. And just like everything else, when we plant those seeds, they'll produce after their kind. And then everyone can enjoy it. And if it's not something people really want at first, then we shouldn't force it upon them. Perhaps they're just not ready for it yet. Hey, were you always ready for it yourself? No. God made sure it came to you when you needed it and not before. So again, that's an example of being kind to others. Some people pick up on things right away and others later on. So we need to demonstrate patience with people while presenting new ideas. And this understanding leads to where we're going to next. But before we do that, we're going to take another tangent of sorts because there's an important lesson to be learned in it. And the reason we're going there is because of how much John had stressed in both the introduction to this class and in session 2A about being kind and forbearing one another in love, even as we're admonished in Romans 1.14. So please turn there. We'll be reading the entire chapter. Romans 14, 1 through 23. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believes he may eat all things. Another who is weak eats herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eats not. And let not him which eats not judge him that eats, for God has received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regards the day regards it unto the Lord, and he that regards not the day to the Lord, he regards it not. He that eats, eats to the Lord, for he give God thanks, and he that eats not to the Lord, he eats not and gives God thanks. For none of us lives himself, and no man dies to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord of both the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's the Bema. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now thou walkest not charily. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. 
For the kingdom of God is not in meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. It's simply amazing how people will warm up to you when you act this way. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroys not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for that man who eats with offense. It's good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Have thou faith, have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemns not himself in the thing which he allows. And he that doubts is damned if he eat because he eats not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Quite a record. Mm -hmm. And here's a quote by John from session 2a. Read that again. If it says if we pick on that other believer because they violate our peck doctrine, we are not walking in love, even if they are the ones who are wrong. Yes, but, yes, but, yes, but do you understand? If that other Christian believer from another church is fully persuaded in their own mind, drop it. This class on the one baptism of original Christianity does not have the subtitle of power for abundant arguing or how to make enemies and negatively influence people or everything we know for sure about baptism and are unafraid to blast. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love John's sense of humor. Well, in this country, we have the Bill of Rights. The founding forefathers wrote these to further expound upon what they had said earlier about our having inalienable rights, which are from the creator, God. And one of those is the Fifth Amendment, which, as we know, basically states that citizens can't be forced to testify against themselves in a court of law. And I'd be willing to bet that these founding forefathers had Romans 8, 1 in mind. You know, the no condemnation verse when they wrote that Fifth Amendment. In fact, I, I bet there's actually scripture behind much more of our Bill of Rights if we were to look more deeply into that. I mean, make, make a nice project for some time up. Well, I've decided to give up that right for just a moment. I'm going to use myself as an example of what not to do. That's right, I'm going to rat on myself, <laughs> and I hope it's entertaining and perhaps even amusing at times to you guys. There was a time when I was rather cynical. I was very proud of the many details I was learning with the group I was in. I can still remember how I thought when I saw people wearing crosses around their necks after I knew the truth, and I thought to myself, hey, I wonder what they'd be wearing if Jesus had been killed in the 16th century. A guillotine? <laughs> and believe it or not, I actually pointed that out to people while witnessing. The good news. Yeah, right. The good news. <laughs> it's true. I foolishly supposed that they would see the logic in it and just take it off. And then they'd thank me for setting them straight. Needless to say, that never happened. No, not even once. Looking back, I can laugh now, realizing how stupid that was. Well, according to Dale Carnegie, we're supposed to take an interest in the things which are important to others. And especially, as he says in his book, they're chief things. Hey, for all I know, that cross was a precious memento of an important event in that person's life. Maybe it was a gift from a dear friend to commemorate the very moment he first decided to make Jesus his Lord while being baptized in a river somewhere, with all of his friends cheering him on. Well, my way certainly was not how to win friends and influence people, was it? Well, here's another example. Somewhere along the way, I decided to begin my, begin my day by reading the Bible for a few minutes, as many do. I personally love Proverbs. My wife here, she enjoys Psalms. And I've heard from many that you just can't go wrong with Ephesians. They call it the breakfast of champions. Well, each to his own. It's a wonderful habit to have. Anyway, for those of you who do that, have you ever gotten up in the morning and just couldn't decide where to read? 
and you fumble around a little bit while sipping your first cup of coffee and eventually you do find something and that's good but no that wasn't good enough for mel that indecision needed to be dealt with so i came up with the cure if that were to happen three days in a row it was just like in baseball three strikes and you're out buddy and my remedy was to simply begin in Genesis 1-1 and read straight through the whole Bible. And that way, I wouldn't have to deal with that horrible indecision, would I? <laughs> because I'd simply pick up where I left off the day before. <laughs> it usually took about a year or so. And I remember coming to many clean pages, which had no notes and all white and things I swore I hadn't read before. But I knew better because that wasn't the first time I had inflicted that little rule upon myself. And I finally remember the times when I finally arrived at Revelation 22, 21, and I'd closed the book with joy, knowing that tomorrow morning I could once again choose anything I like. And I could really relate with what Martin Luther King Jr. said in his famous speech, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty we are free at last. And please, folks, don't ask me how many times I've had to invoke that rule upon myself over the years, how many times I've read the Bible, but you might rejoice with me because I stopped doing that a long time ago. You see, somewhere along the line, I just decided not to be my own worst critic any, any longer. And instead of seeing a Pharisee in the mirror, I saw something a whole lot better. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And little by little, I noticed that transforming into my life as well, because I began treating others that way too. So am I perfect at it yet? No, but I'd like to think I'm making more and more progress each day. We're all aware that Jesus Christ can be found either literally or figuratively throughout the entire Bible, because as the red thread, it's all about him. So let's look for Christ as we read the scripture and put those thoughts in our minds. Because the more we put on the mind of Christ, the more we become like him. And in turn, that's how we'll be treating others as well. And instead of nitpicking with ourselves and others, we'll be loving our neighbors, even as we're already loving ourselves. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed that. I'll leave the witness stand now and we'll return to the regularly scheduled program. Please turn to Acts 1. Pentecost was coming soon, where many things would be changing, and one of the things the believers were concerned with was baptism. And in Acts 1.5, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days hence. We'll address that one a bit later. Look at verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the earth. So, are we included here? Well, check out the word Samaria. I live in New York. Is that some area? <laughs> How about where you live? Isn't that some area too? <laughs> My wife's sitting here with me and her eyes are rolling up. <laughs> anyway, it does say unto the uttermost part of the earth, so that would certainly include the rest of us as well as the Jews. And we read a while back concerning Abraham, where it said, in thee, all nations shall be blessed. When we read the record of the history of the church in Acts and other places, we discover that they never completely finished the work which Jesus implied would eventually be accomplished. Even though they didn't take the word to all nations, we see great progress being made at times. And even now in our day, the word still continues to be proclaimed. So what was really going on among the Jewish culture between Jesus' death and resurrection until Pentecost? Well, of course, they were still adhering to the Old Testament law. And there are many interesting parallels and symbolism concerning all of this. Sometime earlier, Israel had observed one of their four spring feasts called Passover. And many here are aware of how this relates with Jesus being sacrificed as the true Passover. It's understood at the very same time Jesus was being crucified, there were devout Jews elsewhere who were actually sacrificing a lamb 
in observance of this feast according to the traditions which were based upon the Old Testament law. In Leviticus 23, Israel is commanded to count seven whole weeks, beginning with Passover, until the 50th day at which point Pentecost is observed. Seven times seven is 49, plus one equals 50 days. And Pentecost is a Greek word which means 50th. It's important to understand that Passover is also one of the three pilgrimage feasts which required all Jewish men to appear before the Lord at the temple in Jerusalem. And this explains why many Jews were in the temple on that momentous day. And how interesting is it when considering the 40 days Jesus witnessed in his resurrected body, plus the 10 days after he ascended in Acts 1, that the total time from Jesus' death until Pentecost was exactly 50 days. The symbolism is amazing. Well, at that time, we know they were still zealous for the law. Consider in Acts 1, when Judas disappeared from the scene to commit suicide, that the 11 remaining Jews, whom Jesus had chosen, saw an urgency to replace him because of an Old Testament edict. Look in Acts 120. Acts 124, it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate and let no man dwell therein and his bishopric let another take. I really have to admire them for noticing the fulfillment of this prophecy and acting quickly upon it according to what David had written in Psalms. And we see that they chose two who were qualified, took a vote, and then they had 12 again, which was proper indeed. And we won't go into all the connections with that, what the number 12 symbolizes, but we could be here all night. <laughs> so who were saved on Pentecost? specifically Jews only. Look in verse 5, Acts 2, 5, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. At the end of verse 10, proselytes are mentioned. These are ones who had converted to Judaism and were allowed to enter the temple and to attend Jewish festivals such as Pentecost. Verse 14, first part, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. And 22, first part. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. 29a, men and brethren. 41, then they, these Jews from throughout the region, that gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So what does it mean to, by they were baptized? Because water baptism was customary at the time, it's easy to realize that this was the case here. A friend recently put it to me this way. So at first, all they knew was water. But then God took them by the hand and bit by bit convinced them of what really had occurred on Pentecost. And we know that these disciples whom Jesus had chosen had already been baptized in water by Jesus himself, don't we? Well, the following are a few examples of baptism in the book of Acts. Turn to Acts 8. This is about a eunuch who was saved by Philip. Now, ordinarily, he would have had to become a proselyte first, which would require him to be circumcised. And we can see the problem here. It's rather impossible to do that to a eunuch, isn't it? <laughs> which is why he hadn't been allowed in according to the law. But that didn't stop Philip, verses 36 through 38. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all in your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Well, that happened about 35 AD, and about a year later in Acts 9 was when Paul himself was baptized in water. And later on, about five years down the road at 40 AD, we come to the record about the Cornelius household in Acts chapter 10, verses 47 and 48. 
Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. In Acts 16, there's the record of Lydia, the seller of purple, and it says she was baptized along with her household. Perhaps it was convenient that she happened to live right by a river. And this was in the early 50s AD. Later on in that same chapter from verses 25 to 34, it's the story of a Philippian jailer in his household who heard and believed the word from Paul and Silas and were baptized some time after midnight. Turn to Acts 18. Acts 18, verse 24 through 26. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Well, that's water, of course. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. I, I just love the way it doesn't say they expounded him differently or they expounded to him the right way. Saying more perfectly alludes that even what Apollos knew thus far was perfect already. Verses 27 and 28. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Well, isn't it nice how God sent the Apollos elsewhere instead of perhaps shaming him by having him stay in Ephesus and teach his disciples something other than what he had been saying all along? Acts 19, 1 through 3. This is about 53 AD. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having packed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, Hey, we haven't heard so much there we be any of this here Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And he said unto John's baptism. So even at this time, they were still using water. And since this event happened around 53 AD, we noticed that 23 years had passed since Pentecost. Wow. And I was taught back in the 70s, that if the scripture didn't specifically use the word water, then I shouldn't be squeezing it in. Well, it's easy to see what was really going on when we realize that traditions are often very hard to break. Just like that little rule, which I don't use against myself in the mornings anymore. <laughs> Verses four through seven. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after himself, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, so they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, came upon them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. I like that last verse. Sometimes I act a little childish around the house, and when my wife brings that to my attention, that's my go-to verse. See, dear, it says in Acts 19, 7, that all the men were about 12, and some things just don't change, dear, because we men still act that way at times, huh? Oh, my God, her eyes are rolling up at me again, folks. Well, I'll tell you what, I'd be willing to bet there's some wives in the crowd here who can relate with that also. Well, at least it's refreshing that what God originally intended was eventually getting around. But water wasn't the only thing where changes were gradually being made. There were some different classes of people to deal with, too. In Acts 6, because uh, Grecians were complaining about some stuff, the apostles made some new provisions to accommodate them. And that was about 34 A.D. Then in Acts 8, the half-Jews were allowed in. That was about... 35 AD, and these were the Samaritans that John elaborated on quite a bit in the previous session, six. Now, hey, wasn't it great to learn about the long-standing grudge between them and the other Jews? 
that was great stuff because all of that history puts things in perfect retrospect and it makes it so much easier to understand the heart behind what was going on during those times. So thanks again for those things, John. Uh, please turn to Acts 10 in verse 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation that fears him and works righteousness is accepted with him. According to many scholars, this event happened around 40 AD and says Pentecost happened around 30 AD. This means that 10 years went by until the first Gentiles were finally accepted into the fold. And for a long time, Gentiles had been considered as dogs among those of Israelitish background. And back then, the D word certainly wasn't a very nice thing at all to call someone in their culture. And think of our country, for instance. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson penned in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are undoubted by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Well, there's no doubt that his source was from God Almighty, the creator. And we just read that God is no respect of persons. And 87 years later, on November 19th, 1863, Abraham Lincoln said the very same thing in his Gettysburg Address. I remember having to memorize this in school. It begins, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that, here it is, all men are created equal. And it was 10 months earlier on January 1st of that year, 1863, that he issued the Emancipation Proclamation by which many slaves were given their freedom. And from then, another 100 years went past until August 28, 1963, when Dark, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. as part of the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. And even today in 2020, after 244 years, some people still aren't getting it because of their traditions. So it's not difficult to comprehend how the same thing happened during the first century, is it? Not only did it take time for the letters to be disseminated, but consider the discrimination present in their culture against certain nations and sects. As we've seen, that all takes time to overcome. And just in case it might come up sometime, I'd like to begin winding down now by clearing up a little misunderstanding. Turn to Matthew 15. This is the record of Jesus and the Canaanite woman who was a Gentile. Matthew 15, 21 through 26. Then Jesus went thence and departed unto the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And here's the problem. I've heard many who ignorantly teach that Jesus implied this woman was a dog in the demeaning sense, like many Jews considered those of Canaan, perhaps to challenge her or some other ridiculous notion. And after all, they say, even his disciples pleaded with him to just send her away. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that this woman's relatives were the Canaanites of old, though for the most part, these Old Testament answers, uh, ancestors were quite an evil bunch. We had a lot of strange pagan rituals and devilish practices. There were definitely some good people among them who survived the various battles with Israel long, long ago, whose progeny may well have led to this devout woman. And the simple truth is, there were two kinds of dogs in their culture, wild ones and domestic ones. 
Now, even though the Jews had no dealings with dogs of any kind, it was perfectly acceptable for these Gentiles to keep the domestic ones as pets. And how wonderful is it that Jesus understood that, even if his disciples didn't. I bet that all these disciples might learn something from this example of kindness and understanding from their master, Jesus. And we know this was yet another shadow of things to come, don't we? Well, we go on. Verse 27 and 28. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs, the domestic ones, of course, eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Hey, she wasn't even around. <laughs> what a record, huh? Well, that's similar to the account of another Gentile in Luke 7, who Jesus blessed by healing his son, because both of these accounts were about healing at a distance. That's quite amazing. So we must be patient and understanding with people. Let's put ourselves in their shoes by finding out the heart of the matter instead of quickly judging according to the outward appearance. Let's find out we, where people are really at by taking the time to talk things over with them instead of being hasty and then having regret later on after we've lost a golden opportunity to possibly bless someone. Like when I used to force people away by making fun of their crosses. Hey folks, if someone is visiting my home who says he's never really gone so far as to truly dedicated his life to the Lord. And he wants me to baptize him in water so he can do that right away because that's what he's been taught and he believes it. Well, I've got a pool out in my backyard and I'd be very happy to oblige him. And so would my wife. I'd probably use Romans 10, 9 as part of the ceremony, asking if he's really ready to make Jesus his Lord. And also ask if he believed God raised him from the dead. You see, for his sake, not mine, if he tells me that taking the plunge will motivate him to that level of commitment for the very first time in his life, then I'm all for it. No problem. And if someone is already a Jew or a Muslim, I do the same. Because to them, being baptized in water is a powerful symbol. I'd probably even find a certificate online somewhere and fill it out with their name, the date, and truly signed by yours truly. Now, even though I'm not ordained yet, as far as I know from the word, I'm still an able minister. And so what? If that blesses them, then I'm all for it. And then they can have it framed if they like and proudly display it in their living room for all their friends to see. And maybe later on someday, I might even lead them into speaking in tongues if that's what they want. Well, how about a little break before we hear from John? Bless you.